The next day, Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for you. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angels shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the Old Testament and the richness that we find therein of pictures of Jesus through so many different things, and especially today, Lord, this great intercessor who prays for sinners, Lord, that you might give us that heart for our world. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. A couple of years ago, I got into, our family got into, having a saltwater fish tank. Anybody ever have a saltwater fish tank before? There's a couple. Uh, they're a lot of work to get going, but they're really nice. And the fish are more colorful, more beautiful. I, I love saltwater fish tanks now. But thanks to Dallas, uh, if you know Dallas in our church, um, he got me into it. He's a crazy guy when it comes to saltwater fish tank. He's got a gigantic one, like, I don't know, 500 gallons or something. And uh, beautiful. Mine's like 55 gallons, which is still huge. But... For me, it's enough to uh, keep me uh, busy in and of itself. Now, one of the things about that fish tank is that it's like a self-contained environment, a little world, if you will. And so this last week, I finally did my first water change after six months or more of having that fish tank going, which if you do fish tanks, that's not good. You're supposed to do those water changes like once a month. So... First, we started having a couple snails die, and I thought, well, you know, maybe they just got old. You know, in the back of my mind, I know the reason why. But I was like to Marianne, nah, this is the longest they've ever lasted, those snails, and so I think they just got old. And another one died, and so now we're down to one. One snail out of five, and one hermit, I don't, actually, I think the last hermit crab died, but <laughs> anyway... It took a long time for me to finally go, okay, maybe I'll change the water. Now, granted, one of the reasons why I didn't do it is because I was busy and lazy, and it takes a lot of work. It took me like three hours to change out 10 gallons, mix some new salt water, and then put it in and get everything fixed up. And now the tank is like crystal clear, and the fish are happy, and the snail, the one snail that's left, is cruising around the tank. So I'm really excited about that. But it took me a long time and a lot of death in this world of that fish tank for me to actually have my heart stirred enough to help out these poor sea creatures. Now I share that story because we live in a world, self-contained world that God created for his creatures. And in this world, there are issues like sin. And if sin doesn't get dealt with, then people die and they go to hell. And so, if we know that that's true, that sin is real and that hell is real and there's a payment for sin and people will die and be eternally separated from God, then how long will it take for our hearts to be stirred to do something about it? And so for me, I was convicted. God used my fish tank. It's moving on its own. And that's what we see today. Moses is like the perfect fish tank guy. He takes care of God's fish and, and cares about it and puts himself on the line for their well-being. 
He had just spent 40 days on the top of Mount Sinai, one of the great mountaintop experiences in his relationship with the Lord, meeting with God and receiving the instructions for how to build the tabernacle and how to instate the priesthood and and all these laws. And then he was given these Ten Commandments written on tablets of stone by God's own hand. Pretty amazing. Have you ever had a mountaintop experience with God before? A time where you were really jazzed about the Lord at a retreat or a camp or a mission trip or a church service or an outreach or a concert. You know, those times that we have that we see things so clearly and we feel so close to the Lord, that's a mountaintop experience. But the bummer thing about the mountaintop experience is coming down from it into the valley and then seeing how messed up things really are. And you got to live in a messed up world. Moses walked right into that in chapter 32. After a mountaintop experience, he walked into a valley of sinners. And so in verse 1 of chapter 32, let's recap this story. It says, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who will go before us. As for this man Moses... The man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, well, we do not know what has become of him. So absence does not make the heart grow fonder in this situation. Their hearts went astray. In verse 2, so Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me, so that all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Aaron makes this calf for the people because they requested it. They wanted something tangible that they can touch and follow and feel like they had a replacement for Moses in their midst. And in doing so, they settled for something that was far less than all that God is. They created a a golden idol to represent God. Notice how Aaron said, they were going to have a feast to Yahweh. And so he set up an altar in front of the calf, and the people celebrated as if this calf was the Lord. And so they made an idol in place of the one true God. And so notice what happens though. Their low view of God leads to a low view of morals. Once you lower how great and awesome God is in your heart and mind, maybe you take him out of first place and put him in second place, or your theology is messed up, and you believe that God is somehow an equal with Satan, and it's like yin and yang, and a cosmic dualism between God and Satan and and so you lowered God to that point of being overpowered by the enemy sometimes. But that's not what we find in Scripture. Once we lower who God is to a God of our own making, a golden calf, if you will, then the thing that's sure to follow is our lifestyle. Put God second and you're going to worship that thing that you put first. Lower God is something far less than he is. And you're not going to live in such a way as to care about what he thinks. And so, after sacrificing to the calf, what the people did was, notice this is all religious in nature, right? It's a festival to the Lord. It's worship. And then they, in the midst of their worship, partake in revelry, or they rise up to play, as the ESV says, which is a drunken, 
immoral orgy and sexual play. They lower God and then they lower their morals. And things are really messed up when Moses comes back down off that mountain. He can't believe what he's seeing. In verse 19 of chapter 32, it says, And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf, the dancing, Moses burned hot. And he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. So notice the symbolism here. The people break the covenant that they just made with God. Remember, they said, everything the Lord commands, we will do. They made this great proclamation. Hey, we'll serve the Lord with our whole life. Forty days later, they break their promise. And in a sense, they break those commands to serve the Lord their God only, to not make an idol, and to not commit adultery and to not covet and other things like that. They break all these commands. And so, symbolically, they broke the covenant at the foot of the mountain. And so what does Moses do? He comes down with the tablets that has the covenant engraved on it with God's finger and breaks them at the foot of the mountain. It's a tragic scene. Not only are the tablets broken, but so are people's lives shattered. Because they lowered their view of God and it lowered their lifestyle. And there are consequences to sin, as we're going to see today. Consequences, though there, are, there is forgiveness, uh, what we oftentimes forget is that some of those consequences linger. And some of those consequences will cause havoc in your relationships, in your marriage, with your kids, in the workplace, as people who know you're a believer, um, watch your testimony, our sin affects things. In verse 21 of Exodus 32, it says, And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? He's like, how did they convince you, Aaron? I left you in charge of my people, ultimately God's people, and look how you led them. You led them down the wrong path. And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. Okay, I want you to notice that phrase right off the bat. You know those people, they're set on evil. What did he just do? He just passed the buck. He just deflected. When he should have been feeling the conviction for his sin, he said, No, it's not... It's not me, it's those people. Remember what happened to Adam in the garden. Oh God, it, was, it wasn't me, it was that woman that you gave me. She gave me the fruit and then I ate it. And what did the woman say? Oh, it, you know, it wasn't me. It was that serpent. You know, he tricked me. Blame shifting is a sure sign a heart is still in sin. That it hasn't repented, that it hasn't been transformed. But then so is excuse making. He, he doesn't leave it at blame shifting. He says something that's just totally absurd. Let's read on. It says in verse 23, For they said to me, Make us God of Egypt, as for this Moses come of him, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, Let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Now that's a crazy story. Some of you guys have tried that with your parents when you were kids. And we know it's ridiculous, and Aaron knows it's not true, but what does he do? He makes an excuse, because we, by nature, from the time we're born, learn how to make excuses. And so we blame shift, and we make excuses, but what God desires is for us when we sin, is to come down and be humble and to own it and to admit it or confess it. And so 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sins that he's faithful and just and will forgive us of all of our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. But the qualification is if we confess our sin. 
Not if we blame our upbringing, not if we blame our spouse or our parents or whoever, um, and not if we make excuses, but rather if we confess it, it can be dealt with. So the people, at this point, some of them continue to indulge in play, and others continue to deny the sin that they're partaking in. And Moses, as a leader, cares about the people. Although he's angry, he cares about all of them. There's kind of that conflict. Sometimes you can be upset with somebody, but still love them. And that's Moses. He's still a man, and he's still imperfect. As we'll see, he'll struggle with his anger um, throughout the rest of his life with these people. But because of sin, there's a payment that's required. If you drop down to verse 33, it says, But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Wow, that's pretty serious consequences to sin. Ultimately, that's the consequence for every sinner, is that they would be blotted out of God's book. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, if we are all in this valley of sin, and we've all committed that atrocity of the ultimate and sin at the heart is saying in in your heart, forget you God, I'm going to do my own thing. We've like sheep gone astray, it says. It's that turning away. And then all the other things we think about as being sin, you know, cussing and and hurting people and, uh, you know, adultery or whatever it is. We can create a list of all these different sins people do, but those are just symptoms of the real problem. And that real problem is a heart going its own direction, turned away from its creator. And so in Romans 6.23, we see the same idea where it says, For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. Another thing I want to point out, though, before we move on to the next point is that oftentimes we read stories like this and we become critical. How in the world can these people who saw the miracles of the ten plagues in Egypt, who crossed the Red Sea on dry ground, who were fed every day, even this day, with bread from heaven, who heard God's voice, who saw the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day, how could all these people who then made this great promise to God after 40 days, turn away. And it seems foolish, and it seems silly. It's so obvious. Don't they get it, you know? But we have the same nature as they do. We have the same weakness. We have the same flesh that is subject to the same temptations. And so, don't forget where you came from before you accepted Christ. If you're a Christian today, there's a story of how you went from being a sinner deserving of hell to a sinner who is now on their way to heaven. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, Paul reminds the Corinthians of this. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, two things we saw today, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But look at verse 11. And such were some of you. Some of the people in the Corinthian church were homosexuals. Were. Some of the people in the Corinthian church were idolaters and adulterers. They had lived a life that has a story to it. And Paul's reminding them of it so they didn't forget where they came from. After you're a Christian for so many years, you can start believing that you deserved it. You can start believing 
that you're different than everybody else out there in the world, but the reality is we're not. We are born on the same level, with the same flesh and the same disease called sin. But Paul reminds the believers, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It was God's work in your life, by His grace, that you're even here today. Don't ever forget that. As you're looking at a world full of sinners, as you've come down the mountaintop from a mountain high experience with God, don't start judging your brother and don't start becoming condemning towards the world. Maybe you've forgotten where you've come from. You forgot to the point that you're self-righteous. And the way you look at your neighbors, and the way that you look at the news stories you hear every day, which is full of tragedy, and you've become critical. You've become mean, perhaps, in the kind of comments that you make about the filth of the world. But remember, even you still mess up on a daily basis. Thank God for His grace. And so we all need a Savior. And that's what it comes down to, that first point, the sin. What was the sin here? Idolatry and all sorts of stuff. But it opens up a window to see all of humanity that we can understand that all have fallen short. All are sinners. Even ourselves were among that group before God pulled us out. But we need a Savior. And that leads us to the second point. We see the sacrifice now. Moses is a great intercessor for the people. He prayed for them on a number of occasions. It was like he was always praying for the people. First, we see when they were trapped between Pharaoh and the Red Sea, and they thought they were done in. Moses interceded in prayer. At Mount, or I'm sorry, not at Mount, but at Mara, water was bitter, and they couldn't drink it. They had gone three days without water. I mean, that's as long as you can go without water, right? They were on the edge of survival, and Moses interceded, and God made the water sweet. Again at Rephidim, there was no water that time. Um, Moses interceded. The people survived. The Amalekites attacked and tried to destroy this brand new nation that came out of Egypt you know, that was the first thing that happened to them when they got out there and met the first person was that they were attacked. They tried to destroy them. You know, there was a satanic aspect to that. But they experienced victory because Moses was on top of the mountain and he had his hands in the air praying. He had his arms outstretched to the throne of God and it was through his intercession that they were victorious. Every time his arms got tired and went down, they were losing the battle. Moses' intercession was really key in the people's survival. God, at this point, after what just happened in chapter 32, was going to do something a little different than those other places in the Scripture in that he was going to wipe them out. Look at verse 10. If you've ever felt like you've had it with somebody who's tried your temper and your patience... The Lord had had it with Israel. It says, Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make you a great nation. And so, God made this offer to Moses. He said, I'm going to wipe out these people, but I'll make you into a great nation. How many of us would have taken that deal? Oh, really? Really? You'll get rid of all these people that have been giving me a hard time all these days and months out here in the desert. They've wanted to stone me. They've treated me like garbage. And all I've done for them is pray for them. And you want to wipe them out? Be my guest. Make me into a great nation? Hey, that's what I've always wanted, to be rich and famous. 
to be great in the eyes of the world. How many of us would have taken that offer and said in our minds, hey, it's the Lord. If the Lord wants it, who's to hold it back? Just let him do it and I'll reap the benefits. But no, Moses instead prays to God and asks that the Lord relent or turn away from his desire to punish them and rather keep them alive. You see, he set aside his own rights to be important, to become a nation. He set aside his own desires that he might serve the people that were such sinners. That is a sacrifice. And so, when this discussion was going on, another interesting interchange happens. God says, Moses, your people, who you brought up out of Egypt... And he goes on to explain he's going to wipe them out. But notice what God does. He says, Moses, they are people. And you're the one that brought them up out of Egypt. It, it's like God's disowned them. Why? Because they disowned God. But when Moses intercedes, something interesting happens. He prays to God and says, God, your people who you brought out of Egypt... And he, in a sense, is praying, God, please accept them back. They're yours. They're your promised people. The, the people that you promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He actually says Israel instead of Jacob in this passage. But because God is faithful and true to character, that he is merciful, he's just, and he would have been just in wiping them out, he's also merciful to forgive he was true to character, and because of that intercession, relented, turned away from wiping them out. God took another course of action. And thank God that he's done that in our lives as well. You know, God is always just, and there is a payment required for sin, and that sin needs to be paid for, and he doesn't just give mercy without having the sin paid for and so we'll talk about that r real soon. We know there's one who came to pay for our sin. To experience the justice we should have gotten to receive the life that he've, he's gifted us. Now in this case, although the people are spared, and although God's patient, atonement is still needed for the sin that they committed. And so notice in verse 30. The next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for you, for your sin. Now he doesn't go up with a sacrifice. He goes up just by himself. What is he thinking? We'll find out. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will, Forgive their sin. But if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Moses attempts to become the substitute for the people. He attempts to offer his own salvation in exchange for their salvation. Notice that. He goes from not wanting to become a great nation himself to save the people, but he goes a step infinitely farther in offering up his own life, in offering up his own salvation. He says, blot me out of your book. If that would result in the salvation of the Israelites, then blot me out of your book. Well, some ancient cities kept rec records containing the names of their citizens. Names of good citizens and good standing were kept on those registers, but names of infamous people were erased. That was pre-intense judgment to be removed from the safety of the city. Only names of the living are also found in the register. So you have to be a good citizen and you have to be alive 
and if you're not alive, your name's removed because they kept records of the living. Some would call this the book of the living. And so God, in a sense, has a record of all those who are his citizens, the citizens of the kingdom of God. And I find something interesting, uh, another interesting fact when I was studying this whole blot me out of your book idea. We could have spent a couple hours talking about it, by the way. Is that sometimes illiterate shepherd, the shepherds would keep a bag or a bundle with small pebbles in it. And they would keep one pebble for each one of their sheep. And they would keep track of those pebbles, and if they lost a sheep, they would find the one that perhaps even represented that sheep and remove it from their bag. Abigail, when she spoke to David, spoke of this bundle, and it says in 1 Samuel 25, verse 29, If men rise up to pursue you, David, her husband, and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living, in the care of the Lord your God. So again, God's likened to a shepherd who keeps a bundle with a little rock or stone or something representing you. And he holds on to that. You know, if God's holding the bag or the bundle with your name on a stone in that bundle, you're, you're in a good spot. Because he's the all-powerful God. Jesus talked about being the good shepherd. And he says this in John 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. When you're in the Lord's bundle, he's going to keep you. He's going to protect you. And so you can see how Moses' request to be blotted out of the book is not in God's plan. being blotted out of the book of life, being cut off from God's people for all eternity. That was not what God had in store for Moses. And so, what he does goes way beyond sacrificing his own future here on earth. He sacrifices his future for all eternity, but God rejected his request. Moses in his heart was right in his desire for the people, but he was wrong theologically and scripturally. And so God is basically saying, sorry Moses, I'm not going to rewrite my plan of salvation. And not only that, even if I could rewrite my plan of salvation, Moses, you have a problem, and that problem is you're a sinner, and so you've got to pay for your own sin. Nobody can pay for the sins of other people. It's just no man on earth, no matter how good they are, even Moses himself, even Billy Graham, even Mother Teresa, whoever it is that you think as being that great, righteous person, no one can die for the sins of another. In Psalm 49, verse 7, it says, Truly, no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. No one can pay that price because we all have to pay it. We've all sinned and gone astray. And so God does, though, provide the perfect and the ultimate sacrifice, the one who's without sin, Jesus Christ, and the one who's the ultimate sacrifice because he's God in the flesh, therefore can pay for not only one man's sin, but all humanity. When he died on the cross. What we see in Moses, you guys, this is really amazing. What we see in Moses is a picture of Jesus. Remember how I said in the Old Testament, you see Christ all throughout. This was a picture of Jesus Christ. In John 3.16, which many of you guys know it, but we're also going to read verse 17 because a lot of people skip that one. 
Look at this. It says, For God so loved the world, those sinners down in the valley, doing wicked things, that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. Did you know that? When Jesus showed up, He didn't come here to throw people in hell. He didn't come here to condemn all sinners. He came to die for all sinners. It says, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's his heart. That's his desire. And that's why he came, willingly submitting to the Father. The Father painfully allowing his Son to die for your sin. And the Son painfully experiencing the judgment you deserved. You know, it's really unfair when you think about it that Jesus would suffer for my sin or for your sin. But he did it because he loves you. For God so loved filthy sinners. Think about the worst thing you've ever done. God knew about that. Think about maybe all the guilt that you experience because of some past life, some thing that you've done or said, and maybe it haunts you. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he knew about that, and he died for that. He took it upon himself. Your sin, your shame. He became the sacrifice that you might experience his righteousness. And so he exchanges clothing, so to speak. He takes your filthy garments and puts them on, and he gives to you his pure white garments. Robes of righteousness. That was a great sacrifice, but he, he did it because he loves you. So there's the sacrifice, but let's look at the last point, the sentiment. What is your sentiment or your feelings toward the world, toward the lost? When I was in high school, my youth pastor was teaching about evangelism one Sunday morning, and so he asked one of the students, who was a really funny guy, very energetic, to give an illustration, to be an example of what is it like if your neighbor, if their house was on fire, and you were at their door trying to wake them up and get them out of the house. He goes, show the class what it's like. And the wall's the door, so go for it. And so my friend went up to the wall and he starts pounding with his fists and his feet. Boom, boom. And he's like, Bobby, wake up! And he's screaming at the top of his lungs. And as he's pounding on the wall, his hand goes right through it. I love that because the desperateness of realizing how serious it is when people are in sin and they're in danger of hell. How seriously do we take it? Is it like somebody's house is on fire and you know what? We've got to let them know. And we might do something just as crazy as punching our fists through the wall trying to get their attention. We need intercessors like Moses. People that will pray for our country. People that would pray for the lukewarm church. For those who would perhaps reject Christ. Persecute Christians. Jesus told us, pray for those who persecute you even. I mean, are we interceding for the lost? Instead of shunning those who need God so desperately, are we reaching them through prayer and by sharing God's forgiveness with a heart like Moses. In the New Testament, there is a man who does such a thing. His name is Paul. He has two heroes that we know of at least, Moses and Jesus. He follows the example of both of his heroes in Romans chapter 9. And let's read this. In Romans 9 verses 1 through 3, 
he says this, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. He's like, this is really my sentiments about this. This is how I feel. My conscience bears me witness in the Spirit that I have great sorrow or mourning and unceasing anguish, which refers to an intense pain that is tormenting him in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off or was anathema, condemned eternally from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He was so upset and sad that the Israelites as a whole, as a nation, had rejected their Messiah. He was baffled by God's grace being extended to the Gentiles who shouldn't have known any better, but somehow they saw the light of the gospel and they responded in hordes, in masses, and the church sprung up all around Gentile areas while the church suffered in Jerusalem. And so his heart broke. And so he offered, in a sense like Moses, his name to be blotted out, like Christ, to give him very, his very self. But that's why he says, though, he knows it's not possible. I wish I could. I don't know, that's challenging. What's your heart towards the lost? We have three heroes put in front of us, Moses, Jesus, and Paul, and we find in those men and God what our heart should be like toward the lost world. If you really want to know, this is the way it is. Not condemning, not being self-righteous, but rather aching and being in anguish and praying for and interceding for the lost around us. But why don't we do it? It's like me and my fish tank. I knew it was messed up and that snails were dying, but I was lazy. I am busy. How many of you guys ever use that excuse? Well, I'm so busy. No time to pray for people and no time to share with people. I just got too much going on. You know, I think busyness is really the work of the enemy in the church today. It's probably the great sin of the church today. Busyness. Maybe it's apathy. I don't know if you caught that quote by C.S. Lewis at the beginning. It just floored me to think about that. He said, you know, the opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. It's not giving a rip. Not caring enough to do something about it. And so... We see the sacrificial love, one that's willing to lay down their own life. John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. How's your heart towards the world? How, how is even your heart towards a sinful brother or sister who's fallen into some sort of sin that's overtaken them? God has given us a great commission. Matthew 28, 18 says, Jesus came and said to them, All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's kind of like Christ says, You know what? I am with you when you're out sharing the gospel and discipling those people when you share my heart and the Father's heart in reaching out to the lost I am there with you sometimes I feel like perhaps we feel like Christ isn't with us and we don't share in this great deep fellowship with him why? because we're not involved in the great commission it's the great omission the one thing we don't do that we should be doing. Isn't that weird how that happens? Usually the greatest priority becomes the last. Like with husbands and wives. The Bible says, 
Husbands, love your wives. It becomes the hardest thing for them to do. Show care, concern, nurture them, affection. And then at the same time, it tells wives, wives respect your husbands. But that's the hardest thing for some wives to do. Why? Because you don't have to live with the guy. Give me a guy worthy of respect, then I'll respect him. No, it says respect your husband. That's your way of showing love, you know? Guys don't want to be like necessarily slobbered all over. They, they want to be treated like a superhero. <laughs> they want to be looked up to like that. And so why? Those two things become the hardest thing to do, right? So it is with the, the kingdom. I think, anyway, Great Commission becomes the hardest thing to do. Why? Because we get occupied with everything else. Maybe even in churchy things. Churchy cultural things. You know, Christian music, Christian uh, meetings, and um, hanging out with Christian people. I mean, how many non-Christian friends do you have? When's the last time you shared Christ with somebody? Doesn't take long. Like last week, remember I said, it's not hard to get people to feel convicted when you talk about prayer. It's even easier to get them convicted when you talk about evangelism. So what do we do? Number one is pray. Be an intercessor. Pray for the lost. You know, make your list of people that you want to see come to know Christ and then put that list in your Bible and pray every day for those people. I had one of my friends who was unsaved find my list one day. Oops. Hey, what's this? Why is my name on it? He ended up becoming a Christian. Pretty cool. Also, don't only pray for them, but invite them. We made these invite cards for church. I don't know if you know they're there. On the table back there, they're little business card size cards. If you want a really big chunk of those, just uh, let Linda or Aaron know. And we've got a box with a thousand of them in there. Why? Because we want you to be able to invite people to come and hear the gospel. And so, if you don't know what to say, take them to where they're going to hear it. As the Bible says, or not as the Bible says, but as one man said, evangelism is one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. Also, you can tell your story. You might not be the greatest preacher in the world, but you can at least tell somebody how you became a Christian. Why you're different. That's a great question to be asked by somebody. Hey, why are you so different? Why are you always smiling? Great compliments. But take the opportunity to say, well, let me tell you why. And then lastly, of course, the most plain and straightforward way, share with them the gospel. The reality that we're all sinners and that we need a Savior. Jesus came, died on the cross, and that all who would believe in Him would be saved. Do you want to believe in Christ? Yes. Let's pray together. You know, That might sound pretty hard to do, but you know what? When I was a brand new youth pastor, there was a 15-year-old kid in my youth group who came to Christ and he was so excited it only took a couple of weeks before he was inviting his non-Christian friends. And after youth group, he prayed, like a couple of weeks after he started coming to youth group, he prayed with a non-Christian friend to accept Christ. Fifteen years old. If he could do it, and I mean, I heard what he was saying. It, it hardly made any sense, but it was the gospel in there. God's power working through his words. If a 15-year-old can do it, you can do it. I've even heard stories of elementary school children in this church. Some of them are grown, um, who have shared Christ. So, what's your heart towards the world? Hopefully your mind's been blown today. Instead of just saying, yeah, I care about the world, we should do evangelism, to see those examples of Moses that would give up his own salvation for the sake of others. Wow! Wow! What am I doing? Sitting on my lazy boy, watching my fish tank turn into an 
ecological disaster. What are we doing sitting in the church, watching the world turn into this disaster when we could be sharing Christ? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for these examples that you hold up that I don't know if we'll ever attain to them fully, Lord, but at least we can shoot for it. Pray that you give us that kind of heart that is willing to put our own selves on the line for the life of another. Lord, there's no greater love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.